How would you respond if Tyson Fury's post-fight drug test came back unfavorable? What would you do? How would you react? Let's say just, for example, it was cocaine. Would you view cocaine as a performance enhancing drug? Some of you will say no, but then I remember a guy named Michael Ray Richardson. When he was on cocaine, Michael Jordan couldn't check him. When he wasn't on cocaine, well, he was decent. Roy Tarpley, another guy. When he was on it, you couldn't guard him. So maybe cocaine is performance enhancing. Anyway, Mikey Garcia versus Jesse Vargas. My scorecard is a bit different than a lot of people who online, most people I um, listen to or I read their comments on like Facebook and Twitter and some of the uh, YouTube boxing channels I listen to, most of them agree with that 116, 111 range. I, uh, I scored it differently. I scored the first four rounds for Jesse Vargas. Okay. And then the fifth round happened. And so I, I scored the next six rounds for Mikey. And I thought Vargas finished strong and won the last two rounds. So in essence, the fight was a draw with Garcia winning because of the, the fifth round knockdown. And um, I said, okay, maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I didn't watch it. And so I went and then I saw one site had the same score, like a 114, 113. And then I heard um, a channel, a well-respected channel, pretty much say, they, the 114, 113, they wouldn't have a problem with. And I'm like, okay, well, maybe I'm not as crazy. Not, still crazy, but not as crazy as I thought. Um, I thought Vargas did good work, and, and he boxed so well early on. And um, he was just too quick with his counters, and, 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 and he made Mikey miss. And then in, uh, he fell asleep and got caught and dropped in the fifth. And... It literally took him six rounds to regroup. And when the knockdown occurred, I thought Mikey would step on the gas and try to finish him, but he didn't. He didn't do either. He didn't step on the gas enough, I'll say. And he didn't finish him, of course. So, or maybe he did step on the gas. But this is Mikey at 147 pounds where he just doesn't seem to possess that magic. <sighs> a couple of years ago, he had a lucrative fight against Vasily Lomachenko on the table where Loma, who's already in a weight class well above where he should be, um, he could have told Loma to come in at like 138 and had an even bigger size advantage. Um, I, I just, bigger size edge for sure. These guys who fight at 135 now on fight night, they're, they're welterweights and Loma Chinko doesn't, he doesn't blow up like that. So. Um, I welcome a move to 130 if uh, he does that, win or lose against um, 
Teofimo Lopez, he'll go down there and he'll he won't uh, mess around. He'll go right after the Miguel Bershelts and whoever else. Uh, I'm not sure who Garcia beats out of the champions at 147 pounds. Um, his name has recently been linked with uh, Matty Pacquiao. And there's also Terrence Crawford, who Mikey said he would like to fight. Um, I couldn't favor Mikey in either of those fights. Now, I can make a case for Manny because Manny is old with major mileage. But if Manny is the same one from either the Adrian Broner or Keith Thurman Jr. fight, if he's that Manny from either one of those fights, he beats Mikey. Um, he's just too quick, and it, it would be similar to a Lomachenko fight in terms of speed and footwork. Although I believe Lomachenko at the time had that fight happen, he would have embarrassed the bigger man, Garcia. And um, I, I think he would. This Lomachenko, now, he's older. His body is breaking down a little bit. But uh, he's still a supreme boxer, so... Uh, the point I'm making overall is Mikey Garcia has a lot of options and he has a lot of people ready to pay him. Um, I thought he did himself a favor by becoming somewhat of a, a free agent because he can kind of pick and choose where he goes. The question is at what weight and toward which direction does he go? If Mikey, if if Mikey was, what am I trying to say here? If he was completely dedicated to the sport, he'd have gone nowhere near 147 pounds. And, and he would have been solid at 135 or 140 tops if he was completely dedicated to the sport he's not so he's in currently the position of multiple choice um, so Mikey he's he's he likes boxing but he's not a guy who loves the sport Loves meaning he's not passionate about it. He can live with it or he can go without it. Um, just take a look at his career. Look at the layoffs. Uh, he'd much rather sit out and do some things. Uh, when he uh, there was the top rank situation or what have you. And it's like, well, you know, I don't have a problem sitting out waiting till a contract expires. Now it's. I'm willing to fight on a top rank card. So it's like, okay. I think he made a mistake there. If you remember, Mikey Garcia had just got to the point where he was going to become a $1 million plus fighter. And so they kind of built him up and then he got to the point and it's like, okay, now you're going to make a million. You take two years to get out of the contract or three years, almost three years or what have you. And then what do you do? You come back and uh, I believe he fought the one cat before he fought his Latichening. And for the Latichening fight, um, I don't think he got a million or, or, or he just got one million. I can't remember. But the point is three years prior, you will to you want to get your million dollar fight, which means you were going to get a million after that. And so you would probably be at the point where you, you're getting three million per fight. 
or something like that. But you set out, you come back, you didn't get a million in your first fight back. You didn't get a million in your second fight, I don't think. So it's like what you lost, I mean, you had two years or three years or what have you off, but you were at the point where you were three years prior. Like when you came back, it's like you you went backwards. Now, of course, the zone wasn't in the equation and the zone was kind of like a one off. It was a one fight type of thing unless the landscape changes again. But so it just didn't make sense to me. And like I said, though, his heart isn't totally in it. And he it, it, it never was as far as just that passion that love he liked it he did it but uh i believe he got seven million one fight seven million dollar deal from the zone i believe that's what it was anyway earn with hern baby earn with hern you hear me <laughs> um as far as vargas once he recovers he should get back into the mix as soon as he can. Um, he'll be a quote opponent for a big name and he'll be a live opponent at that. Um, no shame in what happened Saturday. He came up short, but he still has plenty left. And I think, um, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I'll see Jesse Vargas in May and I'll ask him. I'll try to get a, a video with him and just ask him because he, he seemed resigned to the fact he lost, but I'm like, dude, a lot of people scored it closer than, than you thought it was. So we'll see. We'll see. We'll just get his reaction. Sometimes a, someone's first reaction is just in the heat of the moment and a lot of guys will say, oh, I got to go back and review the tape and see what we did wrong and all that. But so maybe maybe he'll watch it and score it himself. Um, also on the card was about between Julio Cesar Martinez or Martinez. Take your pick. Who many thought would win via early to mid round stoppage. Um, he didn't. And if anything, his opponent, he gave life to uh, Jay Harris, a relatively unknown Welsh boxer who was 17 wins, zero losses coming in. Listen, we, we put too much emphasis on that O and keeping it. However, I don't, not enough emphasis is put on the fact that a guy who has the O, he's not going to give it up too easily too easy and and Harris fought he fought his he fought his heart out and once Martinez realized Harris wasn't going to lay down he kind of allowed him to win some of the middle rounds before taking some of the late rounds himself um Martinez dropped Harris in the 10th and he won the fight by taking those championship rounds but Harris wouldn't go away um, and he landed quite a bit on Martinez but he just didn't have the power to hurt him and it, this was a good scrap and 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 <sighs> it was a one round fight on my card plus the knockdown so like a 115 112 type of thing where it would have been 115, 113. So he won by two points or one round. You give um, the kid, discounting the knockdown, you give the kid um, one of the rounds that you gave Martinez and then we have a draw. Or we have the same as the first fight, 14, 13 with the knockdown. But, um, and Martinez has been, he's been mowing guys down. But Harris was game. Um, so in a, in a stock up, stock down type thing, Harris's goes up. 
Martinez, well, we'll see. Um, we'll see. A, a flyweight unification with Tanaka could be a prelude to a jump to Superfly uh, for Martinez should he beat Tanaka. And I think right now he's even money with Tanaka. Most people would favor Martinez, but I think he's even money. I do because the question is, did he take those hits from Harris because he knew Harris couldn't hurt him? Or was it because Harris exposed some defensive flaws? Now, if it's the latter, then he will struggle against the better fighters at flyweight. And he will lose to the elite super flyweights. And speaking of elite super flyweights, you people better enjoy Roman Gonzalez Why he's here. While he's here, excuse me. You better enjoy him. Chocolatito. <laughs> he turned the clock back and put on a masterpiece against Cal Yafai, winning by knockout in the ninth round. Um, Roman dropped Yafai in the eighth round with the combination, and he walked Yafai down and 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 um and landed to the body to set up some headshots as Yafai tried to escape on the ropes, and then as he turned, a sweeping right hand dropped Yafai. And then in the ninth, Roman landed a big lead right hand and he dropped Cal. Uh, Cal went down hard and, and as he staggered to get up, it was waved. The referee said, you had enough, son. And he was right. He was finished. Even if he had made it up to his feet, he was done. Um, so Roman, boy. Man, he looks sharp. That time off, uh, that time off truly helped. And listen, as a fight fan who is um, is getting older, and and who's older than most with uh, YouTube channels, it gets hard year after year after year to try to educate people. And sometimes you reach a breaking point from which you don't return. And if you do, meaning if you do return, it's just once in a, a green moon return. <laughs> so the moon is green tonight and I'll try my teaching moment. I don't do this often. You just give up because... Anyway, for multiple outlets, I mean a, a myriad of outlets, to not include Gennady Golovkin or Roman, oh, excuse me, Roman Chocolatito Gonzalez in their top three or four fighter, fighters of the decade is a travesty. I mean, I, I just went to site after site after site and video, and I'm like, where's Roman Gonzalez? Where's Gennady Golovkin? When you talk about the things they did during the decade, um, it's a, it's a travesty. I can't think of another. It's just an injustice. Whatever you want to... All, all these guys, you know, all you guys know is Saul Alvarez, Manny Pacquiao, Floyd Mayweather Jr. Um, and prior to that, all you knew was Mike Tyson. It's like look, you didn't get to see Chocolatito in his prime. 
Chocolatito, you saw the tail end of it. You didn't get to see Golovkin in his prime. You didn't. Well, I hope UK fighters continue to dominate because then maybe, just maybe, it'll teach the younger fans a lesson. Maybe. The lesson is the world doesn't revolve around the United States. Had you known this, maybe you'll use the same computers you do videos on to watch some of the international stars. You do that in the future and maybe you'll know about the next Usyk or Lomachenko or Vozdik or Fury or Joshua. Roman Gonzalez is the former strawweight champion of the world, the former junior flyweight champion of the world, the former flyweight champion of the world, and the former super flyweight champion of the world. I don't think people understand what this guy has accomplished. Strawweight champion, junior flyweight champion, flyweight champion, super flyweight champion, and I mean, he took on the top guys and he went 46 and 0, got robbed in a fight that had he won, maybe he doesn't fight Rung Visai a second time. If you look at the punch stats, there's no, there's nobody in history with those, with comparable punch stats who lost the fight in history of boxing. If I, you know, if I have time, I'll, uh, I'll look for a link. If I don't use a picture, I'll look for a link of the punch stats. I mean, it was unheard of. It's like he landed, he threw like, oh man, if I can remember it, like 1300 punches at like, 40 something percent connect that that's unheard of and then outlanded dude like by 140 I don't, I don't want to say it wrong but you don't lose fights like the connect percentage he had like a 14 percent higher connect percentage throwing like double man i don't even want to get into this and, and here's a guy who's fighting well over his weight and past his prime. But you only saw flashes of it the other night. Masterpiece. I'm telling you, I don't think people appreciate what they saw. And he's not a guy that hits you a couple of times and then moves. I mean, he's there like right toe-to-toe -to -toe with you. Just, just putting it on you, wearing you down, making you miss. A little guy who's at least two weight classes higher than he should be. He's kind of like Lomachenko. It's like, all right, well, let me get on to the next challenge. And if you think you can beat me, beat me, but I'm going after the champions and I'm, I'm taking all the, the tough fights, I tell you. Anyway, and that's why these guys, countrymen, follow them. That's why um, it went, uh, at MGM Grand Garden Arena a few weeks ago, it was like, UK 2.0. This is why. All right. James Kirkland. Yes. That James Kirkland comes back next weekend. I'll be at that fight. It's at the MGM National Harbor and it's uh, Premier Boxing, which means mm, they're probably lining up James for a shot at Jamal Charlo. And Ann Wolf is back for her third stint as his trainer. Yes, third. James has two losses, and both times he fired Ann right before those losses. I'm hoping if he wins and gets a Charlo fight, he keeps Ann in her in, in the corner because once because he 
the pattern is, here comes the next big fight. I'm going to get in this argument with Anne and I'm going to fire her. I hope she's around. She makes sure James is in the best fighting condition possible. I mean, <laughs> the stuff she does to get him in shape, uh, it takes a special person. And he was like a machine. Anytime she trained him, he was like a machine on fight night with her. Now, this go around, I'm not sure even Anne can help him. Um, the reason I say it is the last time I heard James talk, his speech was slurred. And um, so we'll have to see where he is with his motor skills. And, and this was before his brutal fight with Saul Alvarez. So James is 34 wins, two losses with 30 knockouts. And uh, speaking of Wolf, if I get a chance, I'm going to ask her. I'll get it on video. I'm going to ask her about the back and forth uh, between Layla Ali and Clarissa Shields. And I'm also going to ask her what she thinks of Shields as a fighter. And if I can get a third question in, which I will, I'm not going to let Ann walk away. If she was offered $5 million to fight the winner, would she lace up? A final time. I'm going to ask her that. Um, when I first started in the boxing game, you got a fighter and you, you got him in a corner. I don't care how popular he was. You, you pulled him aside to the corner. You asked your 10 questions, your five questions, whatever. When you were done, he'd go to the next guy and go to the next guy. Now you see people jumping in interviews and it's like, multiple people asking questions and then when they post it it's the same interview you did it's just from a different angle and it's like they changed the game so i'm actually going to try to pull and aside when nobody else is around and get my at the very least my three questions off i like Anne. i've interviewed her before and i just want to it's been some time i think she's about 49 50 years old like would she be willing to be Miss George Foreman and step in the ring at 50 and fight. Let's assume, let's assume Shields beats Ali. Would she go ahead and uh, fight the young gun? All right. Um, Back to Kirkland. So James takes on Mark Anthony Hernandez. Hernandez is 14 wins, three losses, three knockouts. So not a lot of power. Now I checked um, Hernandez out and Despite the fact he only has three knockouts, he does have a little bit of pop. Um, he likes to work behind a double jab, and he's very relaxed in the ring. Um, he's very relaxed in there, and, and he likes to be relaxed and take his time. And, of course, Kirkland's game is the fierce pressure. So if I'm Hernandez... I'm going to take a look at the Ishida tape because Ishida was another fighter without a lot of pop. But he stopped James Kirkland. He's one of James's two losses. That one still is head scratching. But I watched that tape and I try to catch James as he's coming in. Um, Hernandez went nine rounds with Banana Rosario. And Banana wore him down. Um, Hernandez got... He got his too, but Banana countered him with this big left hook and dropped him, and he got up, and the referee allowed it to go on, and then Banana threw just a bunch of follow shots, and the referee jumped in. Um, now, Hernandez had never been stopped, and, and so he was extremely upset with the referee, and he kind of like collapsed in frustration to the canvas and just was like, man, why did you stop it? It was a 10-rounder. They stopped it in the ninth, and it's like, wow. You know, I, I, he really wanted um, one more. Now, I'm going to tell, tell you like this. I don't know what James has left. I don't know where he is. Maybe the years off, like Chocolatito may have helped him. James has fought twice. Um, so, 
if Hernandez can hold up early on, this should be a decent scrap. It's, it's just going to depend on how he reacts to Kirkland trying to set a, pa a fast pace. And so, like I said, we also don't know what James has left, so you never know. I think if Hernandez can weather a suspected early rush by Kirkland, he might cause some problems. Can he do that? Is the question. Um, if Kirkland looks okay, he should get right back in there and then get right back in again. Um, he fought twice in late uh, 2019. And I like to see him squeeze maybe three to four fights before the halfway mark of 2020. We'll see. And if he does that, um, then I say, hey, test the waters. Test the water. Um, so, but unless something has changed, Hernandez won't lay down in this one. He's a fighter. He'll try to fight him. So we'll see. All right, up this weekend is uh, Adam Kalnacki taking on Robert Hellenius. And uh, maybe Robert can use his height and reach, but I, I think Kalnacki gets to him and cracks him before the halfway point. And if Adam wins, it'll be interesting who they put him in with next. Um, because... If he is to chase that dream of a title shot, he's at the big risk, little reward point, should he beat Hellenius. Because do you test him against a Ruiz Jr. or, or an Ortiz or, or Ruiz or Ortiz? Take your pick. Do you try him against a, a Michael Hunter or a Joseph Parker? Decisions, decisions. Also, uh, Ife Ajagba is in action on that card. Um, I've had my opinion about him. I'm not going to get into that. I want to see, I want to also see Cuban heavyweight Frank Sanchez as he takes on Philadelphia tough guy, Joey DeVaco. If Joey comes to party, this will be an interesting fight. We'll see what Sanchez is uh, made of. and I, So I need to see more from Sanchez. And, and maybe Joey will give us answers this weekend. So check out the fights this weekend. Check them out next weekend. And uh, we'll catch you on the next one.